Does it say recording on yours? Yeah, there we go. Morning, everybody. Welcome to Reiki On Demand. I'm Karen, and I'm super excited to have Michelle Shinagawa here with us today from New York City. So you're our first from away person, and we're really excited to have you here, Michelle. So yeah, it's awesome. I'm to be here. I, I didn't realize when you originally contacted me, you were on the other side because I met you in the East Coast. That's right. We were lucky. We got to meet in Omega last year for the Wisdom of Reiki conference, which was amazing and unfortunately isn't happening this summer. But yeah, had you planned on going again this year? I, w I had it on my calendar, but you have it in the fall, right? Is it, is it happening in the fall now? That's what I heard, but don't quote me. <laughs> I heard that they were moving, but then everything's going to get moved to fall, so I'm not sure. Right. How's everything going in New York right now? Are things starting to shift a little bit? Yeah, things are starting to calm down a um, little less and less. So I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but I live in the, the epicenter of the epicenter. So like, you know, New York is hit hardest. Yes. And my surrounding neighborhood, um, if you go by zip code, that you can see how many are affected and we have the darkest color. <laughs> So the, the hospital that's 10 minutes away from us is actually has been on national television. Which hospital is that again? I can't remember. Um, I, it's called Elmhurst Hospital. Right. I don't know if you've seen it, but even I see it even in like Japanese Facebook. Oh, wow. <laughs> posting like my hospital in their Facebook saying like, oh, this is what's happening. I mean, you know, now things are has calmed down, but it has been a bit around here. That's intense, hey? That's real, yeah. That's it, like, because it's, I mean, it's intense here, but nothing like that. It's, yeah. <laughs> so, so I just want to just tell everybody a little bit about you. I'm going to read so I don't miss any, anything. Oh, sure. So this is Michelle Shinagawa. She is a certified KonMari consultant, a Reiki teacher and healer, and graphic designer. Because of her healing and spiritual background, she can not only guide you in transforming your space, but also transform your life. She has a keen sense of beauty from her years as a graphic designer and also brings in Zen sensibility, love it, as someone who grew up in Japan where the KonMari method was born. She has been practicing Reiki for over 18 years and has taught over 1,300 students. Wow. Wow. Michelle is dedicated to continually educating herself and has studied extensively with many Eastern and Western Reiki instructors in the U.S. and Japan, as well as numerous other healing modalities, and can bring in a unique combination of various techniques and philosophies. So, that's exciting. We're glad to have you. And, um, yeah, before we really get started, do you mind me just asking how you got into Reiki? I didn't actually send you that question, oh, but yeah. Sure. Yeah, no, that's yeah. fine. It's like a very common question. Right? Yeah. I started Reiki because I was a crazy dog mother. Um, and uh, to, oh, sorry, crazy, yeah. And, and uh, I said dog, right? I'm like, yeah. I heard mother and I'm like, not a kid. But, um, <laughs> and uh, he, was, um, he was having problems with his arthritis when he was six. He was limping. And you know, this is New York City, right? So he has to walk down the steps, go to the, the dog park and all that stuff. So when my friend told me like, well, I'm taking this Reiki class. I heard it's good for humans arthritis. Um, maybe it works on dog. I'm like, okay, sign me up. And he stopped limping for six years after that until he was 12. Wow, so, really? Yeah, it was amazing. So I completely started for probably very different reason for many of you and many of the uh, the listeners or viewers um on facebook live animals just love it hey yeah do you still practice with animals um so that's where my heart is and uh but it's also not easy right because i i cry a lot and my um deepest um passion is helping elderly dogs so I do see elderly dogs. Um, I do a distance session for dogs because it's much easier. You know, sometimes like some dogs, they're not going to be attached. Yeah. 
So I do distance session for elderly dogs and, you know, help them. Also, the owners really need help too. So most of the time they contact me for helping their dog. But at the same time, I'm also do you know, taking care of the owner by, you know, giving them all the things that they can do to take care of themselves. Because for me, Reiki is all self-care. So, right. you know, I teach them that and they, they're not, you know, they didn't realize that's what they signed up for. But they really need it and you know most of the time they're they're very grateful that they're getting that extra thing that they didn't know they came to me for well for sure and people and animals or their pets are so intimately connected so you transform one piece and well just like with reiki the holographic whole everything begins to transform hey yeah yeah so the first question we always start with is what is reiki to you like what is it so for me, um, so I started for the physical healing aspect for my dog, just like I mentioned, right? And then I know that in the West, um, physical healing aspect of Reiki is more well known, but for me, it's a more of a spiritual practice. So it evolved quite a bit since I started for my dog. And uh, as I went continue on my journey, I realized it's good for me. And they helped me centered and grounded. And uh, also it's about sharing love and compassion with people. Um, and uh, my highest value is freedom. So this, my mission is to have more Reiki practitioners so that way they can help other people have more freedom. I mean, first of all, you know, the Reiki students that I have, they get to have freedom for themselves, but then also they get to touch all the people that I don't get to touch. So, sorry, I'm kind of like going on. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I love it. It's like, do you remember that old, old hair commercial? Maybe you don't, I don't know if you're younger than me, but it was like, I, I tell two people, then they tell two people, then they tell two. It's like that, right? It spreads and yeah, the whole world yeah. eventually. It's true. I, I think that's awesome. I yeah, love and I call my student Reiki butterflies because, you know, they go out and sprinkle all the goodness of Reiki to everyone. Yeah, yeah. So I guess it kind of leads into our next question, which is maybe you've already answered it. How has Reiki sort of influenced the path you took? I read in your bio that you were a graphic designer, but it seems like maybe things have shifted a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah. So, oh my God, my path has completely been affected, um, impacted by Reiki. Because right now, so I'm a graphic designer, but also, you know, Reiki teacher and Reiki practitioner and a Komari consultant. It's, I do that like one third because they're all my passion. So, you know, it used to be I had the full time job as a graphic designer and then I did this on the side. And I come from a culture, you know, um, I know that a lot of American can or North Americans can resonate to that. that there's not a lot of freedom and you feel like you need to be certain way you should be or like you feel like you're boxed in you know there's all these expectations and and it's a lot more in japan you're expected to be certain way you need to behave you need to fit in and all that stuff so that's what i grew up with and then also i was really shy i would never be able to do a facebook live like this if <laughs> or even teach when i started to teach i was like oh oh you know like i was I was so anxious, I was so shy, and Reiki really helped me to give my true voice, and then also my passion to be able to help other people who is like that. So um, it, it's crazy that like I, you know, when I introduce myself, most of the time I introduce myself as a Reiki teacher, Reiki master, like that's the first thing that comes. And, you know, coming from the culture where like, oh, you don't have a lifetime employment of, you know, some regular job, right? <laughs> and uh, that I could actually say that. And then also, um, I love traveling and I love education. So uh, past couple of years, one third of a year, I travel around, go to workshop or help out a workshop or teach a workshop. And, you know, get to have that kind of lifestyle where, um, People are often like, oh, well, you know, if you quit your day job, then what are you going to do with health insurance? Or like, oh, what are you going to do? You know, like a lot of people have those concerns. And because of Reiki, I'm tuned in and I can 
choose a path that that guided me to where I am and I call myself Reiki teacher which is like so woo woo I never thought I would say (laughs) (laughs) yeah I totally get that (laughs) right you probably uh did you have like a a regular job before you started teaching Reiki or you started practicing Reiki me I still have a regular job but because of the pandemic going on um it's really uncertain as to whether I'm a teacher but it's in a private school so whether I'm going to be getting a class or not it's all up in the air and it's funny that you're saying this because last night I was thinking I have had enough of something outside of myself controlling my destiny and Reiki does really give you the space hey and the like allows you to have some freedom within what's what choices you're making and what direction your life is going to take so I love hearing that story because it it, it it bolsters me and, and others to hear it from you. So that's awesome. Yeah. And I feel like when you're connected and you know, like when you practice and like, just what, like what you said, right. When we decide to surrender, then it will guide us. Um, it, when we're like trying to fight and going, what if, what if, what if, right. Mm-hmm. Then they will be stuck with where we are. So this, I mean, maybe not just Reiki, but um, the path with Reiki, it's crazy how much upgrade I get. I travel, you know, like I said, I travel like one third of the year. Yeah. 75% of the time I get upgrade or front seat. Sometimes, you know, like I, it just, I, I just like, I just go like, oh, if it's meant to be, I'd like to have, you know, like I'll do long distance Reiki or something and set the intention, right? But I'm not like fighting for it. And sometimes and I feel bad for some people but like sometimes I would be sitting in the front row with people who's been waiting like four hours longer than me and I just attribute to the universe just you know guiding me but I feel like everyone has that except that we have so much static when we're not connected to ourselves. when you don't have your own practice and you miss that like turn that if you took it then you would have got there in the front row or like you get the upgrade or whatever that is oh you totally it's like letting the river carry you then rather than trying to swim back upstream right like exactly. totally. yeah and then you have so much energy left over because you've allowed well the universe to carry you rather than fighting with it yeah yeah yeah, and all that energy left over, I want to be able to contribute to my students and clients so that they can have what they want to do with their life. So it's just like win, win, win situation. Like universe, you know, help me with what I desire. And then I think what universe one is for me to help more people. So that's so beautiful. I love it. Um, what's our next question here? I just, where did I put it? Oh, here it is. Oh, this is the one that I'm pretty excited to hear about. So recently I was following you, you traveled to Japan and you visited some pretty serious Reiki sites while you were there. And I'm really interested to hear about how this impacted you and what the biggest difference you noticed is in the, in the practice of Reiki in Japan and the practice in North America. Yeah, so for me, um, because I'm originally from Japan, although I don't go there that often, I have been to most of the site I visited. Um, it, it was great to visit again, but it wasn't brand new. But the biggest thing, and if there's like any specific question you have about different site, I'll, you know, ask me and I would love to answer that. But the biggest impact that it had on me is to actually connect myself to my root. So I feel like that's another thing that Reiki guided me because I don't know um, if it's true for most immigrants or people that came from another country. When you land in another country, you know, we're so busy trying to adapt to this country. And I'm I'm like really a bad example because I completely just threw Japan away. (laughs) And Uh so most of my friends go back home and all my family is here too. That's another reason. But most of my Japanese friends, they're generally very tied to their root and go home, like go back to Japan every year or every twice a year. And I've only in 28 years, I've only gone back like four times and the twice is just a funeral. So this was the fifth time. And 
you know, first time ever, I was there for 24 days. I never spent that much time in Japan. And I feel like Reiki guided me to be there. Um, And the other thing was, um, this is, I'm assuming that most of our audience is Reiki practitioners, right? So what, yeah, yeah. Right, so one of the things that um, hit me really hard is how um, non-Japanese tourists are not often welcomed. So um, Japanese has a great hospitality. So there's many places they went way beyond, right? Like my organizer sometimes didn't have a place for dinner picked yet. And trying to fit 20 people in a small city is hard enough, but like none of them speak English. Uh, I mean, none of, yeah, none of the restaurants speak English, right? So I had to like translate everything, but, um, to find those places, the hotel go like way beyond and they call like, you know, gazillion places and, and accommodate us. And there's many places that treated us really well, but at the same time, I've noticed that because of the cultural differences and that like we're trying to do our best, or when I say we, because I consider myself sort of non-Japanese. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so we're trying to do our best. And my group was mostly 20 of us, a seasoned Reiki teacher. And a lot of them are Buddhist. So they even chant Buddhist script and all that stuff. They're very respectful. But even then, because the the Japanese people have the previous experience from maybe other um, other people in the past. So one of the experiences we had was we got kicked out of the um, the temple at the gravesite of the um, Master Usui, and uh, yeah, and and I'm actually not surprised because I visited the the gravesite. Um, Oh, maybe it wasn't a temple, maybe it's a shrine. Sorry, I, w- I always get those two things mixed up, but, um, and my mom corrects me. <laughs> um, and uh, I visited like a dozen years ago. And at that time I was by myself. And, you know, because I speak Japanese, I went to the office and I kind of chat with the people at the office. And they were talking about how Master Usui's relative are not welcoming Reiki practitioners to come visit the gravesite. And um, I know, I know that sounds very surprising, but, um, the for some of you, but the reason is gravesite is generally for the family members. You know, it's to show the respect for family members, and maybe it's a little bit different in North America. But for most people, right, unless you're very famous, the family member come visit. So if we have a truckload, a busload of people coming and congregating, it doesn't show respect, and then also like you know. I know it means well, like bringing flowers and all that stuff. If you leave it there, then who's going to have to clean? People at the gravesite. So, and, but I, I, so I was told that. And when, you know, I was, um, when I heard that, oh, we're going to the gravesite. Okay, great. They must have worked it out. But what it seems like what happened is our um, organizer has emailed the, the office and he didn't hear back. So he just assumed it's okay. In Japan, people do not say no. They e- may even respond to you. Have you heard of that? Japanese don't say no. I'm an ESL teacher, so that oh. so I have a lot of experience with Japanese students, and I love them. And yes, I've experienced. They don't. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking but about. It's not easy because they don't say yes, and that for even for me, it's hard to understand sometimes because I have to. You in Japan, they say read the air. You're supposed to read the air to figure out what they're thinking. Because it's a homogeneous country, you're expected to read the air and figure out what they're thinking. So if you don't hear back, then maybe here you think, okay, so that means cool. Because if it's no, you say no, right? But because they don't say no. And sometimes they even say things in a roundabout way that sound yes, but it's no. So so yeah, we, we were asked to leave um, after being there for a few minutes and and i didn't quite you know understand like oh you know why can't can we just like visit we didn't even bring flowers or anything we've been quiet we we're really all very respectful but as we we're leaving the place i saw a um couple non-japanese people just squatting down right in front of the gate right outside of the gravesite and 
I sit and squat down at places like maybe five Machu Picchu or something, right? So it, I, I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do, but when I saw it, my Japanese side of me kicked in and went, oh, because that's really bad look for that grave site. So in Japan, um, looking good and being cordial with your neighbor, like what your neighbor think of you is like the top priority. And if you have people squatting down in front of their gate, that's really bad look. Like if I hated that place, I will send those people over. So, and this is like in the middle of, you know, residential area. I'm sure they were there to pay respect to Master Usui. You know, I didn't think, I don't think they were disrespecting Master Usui by squatting down in front of the gate, but they didn't know. So, yeah, things like that. When I saw it, my, my heart was broken because that's why we get kicked out because there are things like that that happens and probably like all the time. And, you know, and that's not the only place, right? There's many other places. So there's a very difference in the culture on how you need to approach people and how you need to talk to people. And then even like a little things like if you live in New York City, you know that if you're on the escalator, you need to be on one side because the other side people go up. But if you come from a place like, I don't know, let's say like Texas, Dallas or something that you're used to driving, you don't know. So many tourists in New York City, they often just like take up the whole escalator and block it out. And same thing in Japan too, especially in Japan, people are like moving all the time. And if we're not paying attention, then we block out the whole place and then and then we become the stupid tourist. So like those kind of things that so for me the biggest impact is now I feel compelled to educate Reiki practitioner that are not Japanese to you know get the education so that when they go they know what to do. Yeah. And that's really important because I, I hear more and more about people going on pilgrimages to visit his site. And I'm sure that many of our listeners aren't aware of that. And that, squat. well, I, I can imagine myself not squatting, but getting down to, and it, not realizing that what they're doing or what I'm doing is not respectful. Mm -hmm. And respect's important. Obviously, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, what about the practice, the actual practice of Reiki? Did you have any experience with that while you were there? Yeah, so the practice itself. Um, so this time around, we went to visit. Um, are you familiar with Gendai Reiki? Yep. It's run by Hiroshi Doi. So yeah. we had the cultural Reiki exchange. So I think there was 20 of them and there's 20 of us. And uh, that was really wonderful to be able to, and you know, Hiroshi Doi is very, very knowledgeable in so much um, wealth of knowledge and just sitting next to him, I get to be a translator. So just sitting next to him, I felt like I got all the knowledge passed down. Um, so, but we just, um, that's pretty much the only thing with the Reiki. And then also our, um, one of the, um, I don't know, tour organizer was one of my teacher, Frankenstein, And uh, he had the, oh yeah, of course you know him. So he had his teacher, his Buddhist teacher, come and teach us some of the uh, Buddhist chant and- Oh, it, wow. Yeah, that was, that was incredible. Oh, I am so, sure it was. Because when we listened to Franz chant that, that day in Omega, it, uh, honest to goodness, I, I, that was so powerful. Yeah. So powerful. So I can just imagine. Um, so I know what Gendai Reiki is, but I don't know if our listeners do. Would you mind just sharing a little bit more about that? Like what, what exactly the difference is there between that it's, it's more traditional. Yeah, so Gendai Reiki is, and I have not studied Gendai Reiki, so I don't know exactly, but it is run by uh, Mr. Hiroshi Doi. And uh, maybe some of you who is listening, if you're geek enough, you know there is the 
uh, Usui Reiki Gakkai, the association. So um, Mr. Doi belongs to the Gakkai. And uh, so I think a lot of the things that he is teaching in there is very traditional, more Eastern, um, and as opposed to, you know, what um, I call her Madame Takata. What Madame Takata was teaching, that's more Western and more, you know. Right. Fun in some way. Right. I, I would actually love to have that experience. And it's, it's simple. It's, it's quite simple, I imagine, hey? I read his book and yeah. And also, you know, I studied with um, quite a few different Reiki teacher and one of my teachers, Franz Stein, who teaches more traditional Japanese way. So do you chant precepts or um, with your practice? In Japanese, mm -hmm. I don't, but my partner Fred does. Yeah, oh, and yeah, it, yeah. it's much, it's the vibration is so much different when it's done in Japanese and when it's done in English. You can definitely hear how powerful the sound is and how how much of a role that must have played for Usui and for, yeah, the development of Reiki. Like not just the words, but the actual vibration of the sound being carried through your body and into the, to the rim around, so yeah. Yeah, so when I teach and combine both the Eastern and Western, so, um, when and i don't know like where you are where where our listeners are but you know i feel like the western that madame takata created is a lot more fun right i mean i feel like that's the difference between american and japanese <laughs> and and more practical too the so it's kind of like um you know maybe like symbols are used like a magic wand right like yeah. just, like let me give you more like you know and and where else with the Japanese way, it's more for ourselves, cultivating ourselves, chanting the symbol, and you know, embodying that energy. So I bring in both, and I feel like that's the best of the both world because sometimes, I mean, I love the the um, Japanese way, but sometimes like it could get a little boring. <laughs> and but it's such a great practice. Um, you know that you can do every day so it's just like adding the flavor of western and like okay this is all these things you could do too so i feel like the difference although i didn't take any japanese class this time i have taken jikiden reiki with um mr tadao yamaguchi about a dozen years ago and uh you know his is very traditional too and it may just be the lineage or it could be what he teach or maybe because it's in japan i do not know, but it's um, much more simple than the Western Reiki or, or the North American Reiki. Well, it, it's, it seems to me sort of like you just become Reiki. And so wherever you go, the you are the Reiki and it transforms everything around you just simply by your presence. Whereas with the Western style, there's a, yeah, there's a little more waving your hands around and magic i suppose involved with it rather than just being is yeah. sort of what i which is so powerful to me the, the longer i study the less i feel needs to be done done during an actual session or during a sit you can just actually just be so yeah that's beautiful that's a great way to put it yeah that's i i totally agree with what you just said cool um, did I have any other? Oh, I did have one more question, I believe. Oh, no, I've got it. a couple more. Okay. We had already spoken about the pandemic, but I'm curious to hear personally, A, what are some of the struggles you've been um, faced with during this pandemic? And how has your practice supported you over the last couple of months? Yeah, so... Um, the biggest struggle I had is when to stop seeing my clients in person because I wanted to make sure that they're safe, right? I'm sure all of you felt that way and we all decide, we, we, we were left to our own device until the government or the states decide to shut down. But even before that, you can see like, okay, this may not be a good time to see someone in person. Like I may be, I may not be carrying virus, but they may you know, on a way, or maybe they come across someone. So that, and, and um, I was following um, this pandemic in Japan when it was happening in January. So I was reading up a lot about it. And then I saw someone posting on a Facebook saying like, 
you know, as a Reiki practitioner, we need to be careful because even in Japan too, this is not regulated. It's not licensed. So if something happens, then we could just get our whole practice taken away by government started to regulate it. Um, so my biggest concern was my student and clients, but I also was concerned for the industry. I'm not too concerned about myself, but you know, cause I figured make you protect me. But um, so luckily I was um, supposed to be going away for a couple of weeks. So most of my clients were, you know, waiting for me to come back. So the the last time I saw in-person client was March 9th. I, I think I was the first person who stopped seeing in-person client and switched over to, um, you know, Zoom. And like, I am not online person. So that was a, really a struggle. But then a great thing came out of it is that um, I was, uh, and another blessing I had is that um, I was, I'm in the middle of teaching Reiki master program, which is generally four weekends long in a span of four to six months. And uh, that needed to switch over to Zoom. And I can totally see how much impact this, this classes has been making like last weekend we had another one and now we're doing fifth weekend because we want to end it with in person there's there there are many things i could teach online which i am so glad to find out because i didn't think i could do that but you know there's some some things that i need to teach in person so we're gonna have another weekend in another couple months or so but it's just amazing to see how this can be taught like this and we don't I know. person, right? I'm sure you have been doing that too. We have, Fred and I, we've done a few classes online and we were both like, I don't know. I mean, for sure, I believe that there are pieces that need to be done in person, like just for, for to make sure that there's safety of people who are on the table. Like you don't want to say, to teach table work online and then have people going out into the world and working on real people. And that I, I completely agree needs to be done in person, but as far as like the self work and the meditation and the energy practices, holy crow, it can be done online. It's a, it's impressive. Yeah. And surprising. And you would have never done it if it weren't for this. Oh, right? Never, <laughs> never. How are your students finding it? Yeah, it, it, they're, oh my God, they're such super and they're so amazing. So from already on, and so one of my mantra is what's the gift in this? And uh, so early on, I had to really shift my thinking in every situation and go, what's the gift in this? And I share that with my students. So I've noticed like even in the beginning, right? Most of my, um, I mean, all my students are in New York City, which is hit really hard. And I noticed like a lot of other, other groups that I go to, you know, everyone's like really shaken up by it. And when we gather together, they're all focusing their gift and, uh, and at the end of last weekend, we're talking about, you know, at the end of the class, we're talking about like where they are now. And oh my God, I was, I was choking up and a lot of my students were <laughs> kind of in tears too, talking about how far they have come during this time. And they were just so thankful that we kept going. And, you know, it's, I mean, hats off to them that they just kept going because I wasn't sure with everything's going on if they want to continue but I knew that this would be helpful so I put 10 times more effort into than my regular class because I know they knew it uh, they they need it so I'm, I'm such a geek that the extra time that I have I spend it on reading up more about you know all the history or like how they could be helped and all that stuff so oh wow they're they, lucky they've been really enjoying it and That's I can't great. wait to see them in person. <laughs> Have you met them in person before? Oh yeah. So we started in January in person. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. So we Actually, already have to Fred and I have um, a level one, two class that we've been teaching online and we're opening up kind of here next week in very, very small groups. So we're going to meet our students for the first time next week in real life. So we're really looking forward to that. Oh, that's great. Wow. <laughs> Lucky you. I don't know when, <laughs> when we're going to open up in New York City. And I would probably wait like another month before we, we see in person, but we'll see. 
Oh, yes, and we're doing it in very small groups, and yeah. we're going to be wearing masks, and it's going to be hands off. But but we're allowed, you, you know, like small groups of three or four people. So yeah, and I'm assuming you know your area, it's probably way safer. You know, you probably don't need to go as close as I. I only go out like every two weeks, go outside. <laughs> um, I love my home, thankfully. Um, just to run my car and get groceries. But uh, yeah, it just, uh, you know, and, and a lot of people do go out for walk because that's encouraged, but it did not seem that safe in the beginning. So it's just, you know. Wow. Like, do, do you go out and like stick your head out the window and get a breath of fresh air? Between <laughs> No? <laughs> no. Wow. I mean, I, I do have a, like a rooftop in the back. So sometimes, but I don't like to, it's a shared one. So I just open the door and get the air sometimes, but most of the time I'm, I'm pretty content. I have a, a very great diffuser that's diffusing, you know, all the nice fresh air. Yes. So good. Wow. That, that's, that's hardcore. <laughs> Not leaving a house for two weeks. That's yeah. Um, so I think you've kind of answered this one is in the, how have your practices supported yeah, you? I think my practice is really focusing on the gift. And uh, I mean, there's, you know, so despite of all the, the things you heard from me and you got what, <laughs> um, that I don't go out for two weeks, but I really, I mean, many times I feel like, oh my God, this is such a blessing that I can just stay home and you know, really take care of myself because I think my body was a little worn out from all the traveling I was doing. And uh, so I can really focus on self-care and then I can also teach other people more self-care. And so, yeah, it's just, I mean, if we want for Reiki, you know, that like I would not be where I am. I'll, I'll probably crawling up somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I hear that for sure. I, and I'm going to start repeating that one too. Actually, I noticed you posting it, the what is the gift in this? Oh, I, and, I, yeah. and I really do think that's a powerful, powerful way to look at things, hey? Like just to try to find a different perspective on things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah cause when you start looking, that's the only thing you can see. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. You're right, actually. It's hard to see the other, yeah, that's true. Um, the last question that I have is where do you see the um, field of energy work and Reiki and this world heading over the next few years, particularly after this challenging time that we've gone through? Like, where do you, where do you see it going? So I see it going, like, you know how, um, it's very interesting. A lot of people are like, I need to go see my hairstylist, right? And I only get my hair cut like every half a year, so I don't quite get it. But I feel like maybe after this, more people will be interested in doing self-care. So maybe not just the energy healers, but I feel like after the haircut, then the next step after, right? <laughs> so that's like the immediate need, right? But then after that, after people get settled, they start to may see more go internally. So maybe not just the energy healers, but, you know, the spiritual work or energy healing. I feel like people are going to turn more to that and, you know, hopefully start doing more self-care or being good to, you know, everyone's talking about how we're being great to the earth and now we have less smog and, so maybe we are actually learning to be great to ourselves and take care of ourselves and then also people around us. So I feel like we are going to be on demand um, more. Um, you know, it may not look the same way as it used to be. Maybe there will be more online classes. Then, you know, you get to connect to people that's from outside of your immediate vicinity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Fred has said a well, many times, but I've heard her say it a few times that her dream is that one day not practicing meditation or doing Reiki is like not taking a shower and brushing your teeth. It's just like something we do to take care of ourselves. It's like self-care, keeping yourself clean, clearing our own smog, right? Like out of our yeah. own field. So yeah, oh, I, I love, love that. that. I'm totally on that vision. Yeah, absolutely. 
Great. Well, thank you, Michelle. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience or with me today before we go into our distance Reiki session? No, this has been really awesome. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. And thank you so much for coming. We really appreciated it. Oh, you're welcome. And really, I just appreciate you. You know, you said that you are not really like online person and you just like took on and I, you know, I've seen quite a few of your videos and, you know, see all the posts and it's just amazing what you're creating. So thank you. We're enjoying it. We really are. And we certainly wouldn't have done it had we not found the gift in, in the last few months. We, we really wouldn't have. It's neither of us going in front of a camera is, is, is um, a little bit unnerving, right? It's yes. frightening. Yeah. <laughs> until you get used to it <laughs> yeah and then it just becomes normal just like anything right it just becomes normal yeah so michelle you said that you wouldn't mind leading us in just a sort of a grounding before we go into our reiki session and then yeah. usually the way we do it is that you and i will turn off our mics and cameras because it's kind of weird to have <laughs> us sitting here doing reiki and then in 15 minutes or so we'll turn them back on and check in with our audience and say goodbye Great, sounds good. Cool. So, All right, so I'm gonna turn it to you now. I'm really looking forward to this. Great, so I, I thought about this and I felt like if all of us are Reiki practitioners, I know we come from different lineage, but maybe I thought that we would just practice our, um, so what I'm gonna share is how I prepare myself to give session. Beautiful. And maybe a lot of you have your own, so you can um, incorporate that or you can follow me along, but I'm hoping maybe a lot of you already do this and then we can just do this together or maybe you get to learn something new. Awesome. So, great. So um, you can, you know, if you like, you can keep your eyes open um, so you can see what I'm doing if you do not know what I'm talking about, but um, you can, if you can just sit somewhere very comfortably and it will be good if you can actually sit up so you're not leaning back. And I would like you to imagine being in your healing temple, a sacred place where you feel safe and guided. And once you place yourself in your sacred place, I would like to do dry bathing together. So if you do not know what dry bathing is, you can open your eyes and you bring your right hand over to the left shoulder and you go crosswise. And then now the other side and go crosswise. And then now back to the first side, right hand over to the left, go crosswise. And then now bring your left hand out and then you go brush the arm all the way to the fingertip. And now bring your right hand out and then go brush all the way to the fingertip. And then now bring your left hand out again. And one last time. And now you can bring your hand in a prayer position, what we call gasho. And I want you to imagine this Reiki energy that you're surrounded by this amazing universal life force energy all around you. And now that you're breathing in, either through your mouth or your nose, and breathing in all the way into your tendon, which is two inches below your belly button. And retain the breath there for a couple of seconds. So you're retaining the Reiki energy in your tendon for a couple of seconds. And then you breathe out. Imagine Reiki energy coming out from your hands and your feet and all around you. Let's do it one more time. Breathing in Reiki energy all the way into your tendon, which is two inches below your belly button. Retain there for a couple seconds. And breathing out, feeling your Reiki energy coming out from your hands and your feet and all around you. And now I will chant Reiki precepts in Japanese. 
So for those of you who has a practice of chanting Reiki precepts in Japanese, you can chant with me. I wish I could hear you, but I'm sure you do great. And if not, you can just listen in on the vibration. So let's take a nice deep breath in and breathe out. Another nice deep breath in and we start. Kyo dake wa ikaru na, shinpai su na, kansha shite, kyo o hageme hito ni shinsetsu ni. Kyo dake wa ikaru na, shinpai su na, kansha shite, kyo o hageme hito ni shinsetsu ni. Kyo dake wa ikaru na, shinpai su na, kansha shite, kyo o hageme hito ni shinsetsu ni. Kyo dake wa ikaru na, shinpai su na, kansha shite, kyo o hageme hito ni shinsetsu ni. Kyo dake wa ikaru na, shinpai su na, kansha shite, Kyo o hageme hito ni shinsetsu ni. And now we'll be sending you Reiki. So you, if you like, you can lay down or you can stay sitting and just be ready to receive whatever you desire in this moment. Beautiful. I'll see you in 15 minutes, Michelle. Thank you so much for that. See you in 15 minutes.
Okay. Um, thank you, Michelle. That was wonderful. That's so, great. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just looking at our Facebook feed. Frederic says hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Did you have anything else you wanted to add uh, today before we say goodbye? Um, so is it okay if I talk what I offer? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, of course. I should have. Yes, please do. And I've, I've got your bio or your web page in, in our description as well. And I'll post it again. Please tell us about what you offer, Michelle. Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, I have not come up with a program, but if you're a Reiki practitioner, if you're thinking about going to Japan um, one day or maybe next year, maybe not this year, um, you know, please be in touch with me. I'm going to create something. Maybe it's a course or it's PDF or, you know, a video where you'll be educated in Japanese culture. So when you show up, like even like how to hop on the train right like they have a very complicated system how to make it easy so um email me and let me know and i'll put you on that list um and i i also mentor um reiki practitioners and reiki teachers who want to deepen their practice or their teaching with a more eastern approach so that's wonderful and are you able to do that online as well now uh, actually that's something i always did online because not everyone was from new york and they often find out i'm japanese and they they're curious you know how i teach and uh, so i actually was offering it via skype already anyway great great and can you tell us a little about the con marie work that you do uh, yeah. yeah, so it's funny that I threw Japan away and then I'm like attracted to um, Marie Kondo's work. So what's beautiful about um, KonMari is it's a decluttering and organizing method for those of you who does not know what that is. And uh, it's based in a spiritual um, teaching. So she, she actually was uh, working at the Shinto shrine for when she was like in college, you know, like she was just giving away charm and stuff. So she, I, what I love about it is it's not just like, oh, let's get things out the house. It's about really going deep within yourself and figure out, figuring out what sparks joy. So you touch every single item that's your position and you realize you see what sparks joy which is what you keep and what doesn't spark joy what no longer serves you anymore so when you go through and there's a specific method to this um but when you go through them then you realize um often what you have been holding on to so it's not just the physical items but also you start to see what you need to maybe let go in your life. It could be a relationship or a job. And then also um, the path that sparks joy for you. So it's, a, it's actually a lot of my clients, my Reiki clients also become Komori clients because it's such a nice um, march of the spirituality. Yeah. Home organizing. Totally. So it's not just a method of folding your underwear. It's got a lot more to it. it <laughs> yes. But then there's a folding underwear. So <laughs> I never fold them. And, and then now I fold them. And it's just showing respect for each item you own. So, you know, um, I, I'm more the merrier person. I love so many things. I, I actually own a lot of items. Often people say, oh, you're Komari Kosota and you must be a minimalist. No, I'm not. Um, um, I have a lot of items, but now I know what I am responsible for and how to treat them well. So, you know, like, I don't know, like, if I should say, like, dogs, right? Like, you know, most of the people won't end up having 100 dogs because, you know, you can't take care of them. Yeah. So, same thing with the items that you own. If you own them, then you want to be responsible and you take care of them. And then they start to shine. Like, when you actually choose them, and it's even like something that was stuck in the closet forever. And then you realize, oh, hey, I had this. And then you actually choose them. They start to sparkle. They started to have life. And then, you know, you treat them like when you're folding them, you actually reiki. 
she doesn't say it that way, but I reiki them, reiki iron, hand iron them, and then I fold them. When you take care of them, you know, like same thing with people in your life, when you start to give them more attention, then they become nice to you, they sparkle for you. And same thing with the items too. Well, that's so, so cool. I can just keep going. So I'm yeah, I love here. hearing about it. So, so I will repost um, all, all of your information again. And I've been recording this and I'll send this to you as soon as it's converted and you can put it on your page and we'll also put it on the West Coast Reiki Center's page. So oh, awesome. people everywhere can listen to our chat and learn about all of the wonderful things you're doing, Michelle. Thank you so much. This, thank you. It was so much fun. And really, thank you again for doing this for, for me, but also all the people who is benefiting from your group. Thank you, Michelle. Take care. And I hope to see you soon in real life. Maybe in yeah, Omega or something. That would be great. Hey, okay. bye. Take care. Bye-bye.